now our speaker today is Bruce Norman. He's a research scientist in the electronics, lighting, and network groups at LPNL with a focus on the intersection of network technology with energy systems. Uh, his work includes early work on energy efficiency of electronic devices and outlining the role that IT plays in electricity. His degrees from UC Berkeley with a bachelor's degree in architecture and master's degree in energy and resources. And he has been with the, the lab since 1983. Uh, without further delay, I will let Bruce share his slides and begin his presentation. Let me... Yeah, and I agree with the slide there. I absolutely welcome quick clarifications or during it, but for longer discussion items, try to hold them to the end so we can first get through the slides and then dive into yeah. Back, back one slide. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, as you noted, I've been at LBL for a long time. Um, starting in the early 90s, I worked on electronics, energy use, computer, televisions, network equipment. And towards the end of that time, realized that um, being connected to a network was a really important part in driving energy use of electronics. Like particularly when we had desktop PCs, commonly they would be left on 24 seven. So I realized I needed to get into network technology to understand the reporting. Um, I started getting into looking at network to understand how we could uh, adapt and change and use network technology to reduce energy use. And that got me involved with organizations like IEEE and the IETF, the people who brought you the internet protocol. And while some of my colleagues were doing things like embedding better window coatings or better ways to construct fluorescent uh, light bulbs uh, or working on appliance standards to make it illegal to sell appliances that use more than a certain amount, for electronics, I realized that uh, technology standards kind of played the, the same role that the law of physics played for a lot of other Indians. As the public sector, if I was going to try to influence the market, since we don't make or sell anything, getting involved in technology standards was one, one of the most effective things I could do because technology standards can either prohibit or require energy saving features. So they're extremely powerful. Uh, if you ever want to find me, Google my name, you'll find my webpage. I'm, I'm um, easy to find, uh, and I welcome any you know questions or comments um, after this. So um, to advance, I what's the way to advance? Okay. okay, great. Um, so this slide I actually used several years ago for a different talk um, to help clarify that this notion of how you see the world really depends on where you're starting from. And in my area working with electricity, oftentimes most people in the conversation take pers perspective of the utility grid, which is an important and valuable perspective to take, but I'm a buildings person. I sort of, so when I think of what's behind the meter, for me, I'm sitting in my house or office, there's the meter and beyond it is the grid, whereas grid people think the reverse. So it really, people's thinking about what's possible, what's desirable gets shaped by, by their context. And I thought this was kind of funny because I Googled around and found other examples of this New York cover and there was one from Stanford. So that was a nice tie in with today. Um, so for myself, while I was born in Southern California in the summer of 1969, my from Southern California up to uh, Palo Alto, where I grew up. And about three months later, there was the first computer, computer communication at distance from UCLA to Menlo Park. So almost the same path at almost the same time. So I kind of feel like I have some visceral connection to, uh, to IT network technologies in that way. Uh, I went to high school at Palo Alto High School on land that is entangled with Stanford. Uh, I, um, when I was, I don't know, maybe second or third grade, I got to 
video game on a round CRT is pretty cool, particularly back in the early 70s. Um, when I was in eighth grade, I decided that we did time wrong. I, I like to question fundamental principles. And you know, this clock in the middle is a decimal clock. So I actually built a digital decimal clock that had a LED display that showed time and decimal time in fractions of the day. But I also realized it's feasible to change the second as the fundamental unit of time in the metric system. So I moved on. But then I got hired um, right after that. And I, when I was in high school, I worked uh, in the building that's now the press headquarters. Now, it, at that time, it was Hewlett Packard's research lab. So I did programming when I was in high school. So I have a, a bunch of connections to here. I then went to Berkeley and never came back. So I'm now pleased to actually be <laughs> back here with sort of returning closer to where I started from. Uh, one, one thing I keep coming back to is that in the terms of the technologies we have, the best things in life are simply universal. Every email address on the planet since about 1992 is exactly the same format as a simple user at domain. And of course the domain name system was a technology that already existed for um, reaching the computer. So it was one simple technology built on another simple technology. Same with web browsing, USB, uh, the power symbol. If you're gonna turn something on and off, you're gonna probably look for a power symbol, aren't you? And it turns out, fun fact, I am the world's expert on the power symbol. And if you don't believe me, go to Wikipedia, look up power symbol, you'll see that I wrote um, all the important references. Uh, so anyways, and money. Money makes the world go round, money's pretty universal. So, I mean, money is always the best thing in life, but it's really important to have. So an awful lot of problems that I come up with with people is people who insist on wanting to build really complicated systems and complexity adds costs, it impedes some privacy, it reduces interoperability. It's just complexity is our enemy uh, when we don't need it. Now, occasionally we need it, but we should try to avoid it if we can. And something that's occurred to me that um, hopefully this is uh, an example of where we are, is that in biology, people realize that in the fossil record, you had these long periods of time where the species would be relatively static, slowly evolving, and then you have some events which cause a, a dramatic change in the genome pool of, of, uh, of, of the animals there, or plants too, presumably, and you get <clears throat> this punctuated equilibria, and then you have a lot of change over a short transition period of time and then another static thing. So with communications, we clearly have that. Right nearby, uh, we invented internet technology and that took a few decades and I would say we're now past it. You know, we don't, we've literally thrown away the old phone system. Not only thrown away the hardware, but also a lot of the ideas that underpin the old phone system. And you know, while things do evolve with internet technology, the fundamentals really have not particularly changed. Yeah, we went from IPv4 to IPv6. It didn't really change anybody's experience of it. And other four technologies, TCP and such, are, are all quite stable. So hopefully, with electricity, we are at that cusp of a quick trans. Oops. Uh -oh. Transition time. Okay, better. <laughs> to a, to a much better future. So we look at our electrical technology uh, from 1882 when uh, the electricity grid was invented in New York City. The way we generate power has dramatically changed. It would be you know, unrecognizable to Edison. Uh, the way we use electricity has dramatically changed. And power distribution inside the buildings, because again, I'm a buildings person, has also hardly changed. You know, sure, we've got E and we've got a few buildings with batteries, but the vast majority of the infrastructure in buildings would be very recognizable to Edison if he somehow return to life today. Um, I just added this this, um, this other column, which I hadn't previously used for sort of the wide area distribution of, of electricity, which has also not changed that much. And a lot of this is just to, to the inherent nature of um, AC power systems, because the way we construct our systems, it's really hard. Um, and that's really unlike internet technology, where internet technology, because of loose coupling and layered architectures, it's much easier to evolve. So I would say that it's highly time to rethink how we do electricity to move to much better technology, not just a little better technology, 
Because if we're going to address climate change meaningfully, we have to have much better electrical technology that's lower cost, more flexible, easier microgrids, that kind of thing. So the, the electricity grid today is what I call a unitary system, just like the old phone system was one big system. Uh, the phone in my house when I was a child was black, it had a dial. It could only make phone calls and there was no local intelligence. It was just a phone. And of course, that's a completely different model from how we do things with internet technology, wherein we have rich infrastructure inside of buildings. Um, and you know, you, you, your network in, in, a, in a house or a dorm room or a office building is loosely connected to the wider internet. It's not tightly coupled. But with the electricity grid, everything is tightly coupled on the 60 hertz frequency. And so it ends up being one single big system, which again is part of why it makes it difficult uh, to evolve. And it's also fundamentally an analog system. So there are a lot of similarities between the old phone system and the electricity grid we have today. They have a whole a lot of characteristics which are very similar. And all these characteristics, fundamental characteristics, which have been changed when we went to, uh, to internet technology. And so there's this obvious question of how, how what is the electricity equivalent of you know the internet now some people will refer to a quote unquote internet of energy and if somebody uses that term you know they either do not understand how the internet works they do not understand how energy works or both because internet of energy makes no sense um and i'll, I'll get to that in the next slide um but clearly there is something which i call a network model of power uh, that we need to do and the way I've explored this is only inside a building. And whether it applies to the utility grid, I don't know. I don't think it does in the near term. It may in the long term. Um, but I'm only trying to make claims about how things should operate inside of buildings. But the way things operate inside of buildings relates to the grid because we need to coordinate the grid, uh, particularly for demand flexibility, uh, more and more. So um, if we look at these two systems, uh, we need technology to move a resource from where it's available to where it's wanted. So if the information is on a web server, you want it to move it to your web browser. If the electrons are in a power plant and you want to move to this computer so we can use it, you need to have technology to move things from point A to point B. All data packs, different source, different destination, different content. The electrons are all the same. And I know that because I work for a physics laboratory and the people down the hill from me tell me that electrons are all the same, which in a sense actually makes it a much simpler problem than the communications problem where all the packets are different, which we have already solved. So we've, we've done the hard thing. We just need to do the relatively simpler thing of managing flows um, of electricity. So the internet goes over the internet protocol. No matter what your application is, it all goes through the internet protocol, no matter what your physical layer. So what we really need is we need a fundamental mechanism which can play the same role that the internet protocol does for electricity. And in thinking about that, I only come up with price and quantity as that possible mechanism. It's not like I came up with five mechanisms and price and quantity seem to be the best. I actually just can't even think of another mechanism that could possibly be a mechanism. Uh, and if somebody else has some nominations, please tell me, because in the last you know, 15 years I've been thinking about this, I haven't come up with another one. And, and in a sense, that's not surprising because we use price and quantity every day in our lives. Um, it's, a, it's a basic way that our economy and our uh, infrastructure work. So that's not a surprise. So um, the internet protocol, that fundamental mechanism, routes data over multiple hops, point A to point P, point B because the packets are different. Since the electrons are all the same, routing an individual electron or a group of electrons over multiple hops in a network doesn't make sense because the electrons are all the same. Now you do need to manage the location, quantity, and timing of the electrons. So you're managing flows, but they're flows by identical things. They're not uh, routing, it doesn't make sense. So that's why I said the concept of internet of energy doesn't actually make any sense. Now there's this additional concept here of capacity. Any, any pipe, whether it's a, a data communication path or uh, an electrical connection has a maximum power capacity it can do. So on the internet, when there's a capacity constraint, things slow down and just take longer to get there. And we have TCP to you know, manage the 
uh, the data rates of, of packet flows. Um, so that's how we manage capacity constraints uh, in IT networks. In that we uh, don't overload circuits because you could introduce a safety problem or trip circuit breakers or such. What we typically do with electricity systems is we way overbuild capacity uh, to make sure we're not going to run out and then have extremely conservative consumptions about how we use it because, because our electricity system is basically built on not knowing what's going on. Um, and it's, surprising, it's amazing how little utility grids know about what's going on with the edge of their system make conservative assumptions to make sure we don't exceed it, which means that you're actually wasting a lot of capacity um, that, that might be available. So if I plug something into this USB port, it doesn't just get power, it has to ask for it. So there's actually digital management of capacity in devices that we all own today. So we just need mechanisms to scale up capacity management to entire customers. So in terms of how the internet works, that is a collection of both mesh networks and tree structured networks. And the wonderful thing about internet technology is that it doesn't really um, matter. It's flexible and operates both ways. And that's true on the wider network. And it's also true inside the buildings where you can have a tree structured IT network or you can have a, a mesh network of switches and routers uh, collectively. Um, so it's a flexible, flexible technology, which is nice, which means that you can make or break a connection at any point and the system will automatically adjust. It has somewhat similar characteristics, but because it's driven by the laws of physics on the wide area network, uh, you know, paths flowing over the transmission system is a complicated topic that I know nothing about uh, where that comes into play. Uh, inside the buildings, you just tend to have tree structures of electricity because uh, with an AC power system, having a mesh network um, doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense. But if you use DC distribution, it actually can. It's the internet protocol that's operating across all of these links, no matter whether you're sending a photo from your phone to your TV or whether you're emailing somebody in Africa, it's the same mechanism in all countries and all building types, types for all application topics. Even if you're not connected to the wider area network, you still use the internet protocol to move data. It's a universal fundamental mechanism and price can and has to be that. So there's the OSI model, the has seven layers, it's usually simplified to just five. The internet protocol sits in the middle to isolate your physical layers from your application layers. And doing so is really essential to making the internet work at all because if we had things that were more complex or more entangled, it would get so difficult that it would make it much harder to manage it. But it's the simplicity of internet architecture which allows it to be flexible, to scale, to drive down costs, make products interoperable. This, these system architecture foundations are really essential to making uh, a highly functional system. So there's this key notion that you want to isolate, you want to isolate the complexity of a LAN from the WAN and vice versa, so that the wide area network doesn't need to know what's going on inside of your building and vice versa. Uh, you want to separate, isolate the complexity of applications from the complexity of physical layers. And that allows you to then evolve systems in a very healthy way. But like how our electricity system works today, where we have entangled technologies. And that's why we haven't really evolved it very much since 1882. So um, there's other things, and this is really not a complete list, where on the phone system, you had the actual data plane of a switching circuits, and you had a control plane that was separate which sort of orchestrated how those circuits were set up. With the internet protocol, those were unified. It's also where the control signals go. And there's a whole lot of advantages to that so that when you break a connection on the data, you also break a connection on the control, and so you really know what's going on. With our electricity systems, with these things separated from each other, you don't necessarily actually know what's going on. This is a smart grid diagram that somebody created about 10 or 15 years ago. I have never seen such a diagram in my work with um, internet and people. Nobody who works with network technology would ever create such a structure like this because it's just not workable. But in the electricity system, people are so used to having these things that are organized like that because they've been sort of patched together with duct tape and bailing wire that 
they think it's okay. It's not okay because it's gonna be expensive, it's gonna be brittle, it's not gonna be highly functional. You need simple systems in order for them to be highly functional. So another important thing is that we have to throw away ideas when their time has passed. And there's a whole lot of ideas that underpin our electricity system, which are simply obsolete. They're not okay for the future. Uh, like demand charges. Demand charges in billing are, are evil. And I think that's the only polite term for it. We need to just get rid of it. You know, like, it's like the electoral college or any number of things like that. We just need to get rid of them. Um, analog communication is very 19th and 20th century. Everything's, you know, future is digital. Um, the separate and control of data planes, um, unitary systems versus network systems, tightly coupled versus loosely coupled. Deterministic operation is a really critical one. So, um, you know, the old phone system was completely deterministic. You placed a phone call, it set up a circuit, you were guaranteed this much uh, data capacity whether you used it or not. The internet is completely non-deterministic. You send out a packet, you just hope it gets there. It almost always does. If it doesn't, rebroadcast it, but it's completely non-deterministic. In the 1950s, multiple people went to Bell Labs and they said, there's this thing called packet switching we think is the future of communications. And the clever phone company engineers said, we were aware of that, we know it's impossible, therefore we do not need to study it. So they just couldn't imagine um, because of the way they thought about the world because they only believed in deterministic systems that a non-deterministic system could actually work. Not only that, but they could the deterministic alternative. Now the weird thing about the electricity system is the demand side has always been non-deterministic. Now I, as a customer, I never tell the utility um, what it is that I plan to do as far as electricity. The utility just has to forecast things based on uh, past experience. And luckily for the utility, they don't care what I use. They only care what everybody collectively uses within some region. So since you know variation merge out, then it's all fine. But it's completely non-deterministic. On the supply side, things are very deterministic where you orchestrate with wholesale markets, which power plants come on. But a lot of people in the electricity system believe that the only way to have a better future is to make the demand side deterministic. And they are just wrong, just like the phone company engineers who didn't believe that internet technology was possible. And that's that mental problem of people thinking, having misconceptions about how reality is uh, barriers. So, so throwing technology away is a critical thing to do. So I, I sort of started collecting some things that are these myths. Uh, that sort of impair people having clear thinking. So we used to have application specific physical layer of communication. TV broadcast signals, you could only send out TV signals. FM radio or AM radio, they only send out audio over those things. You know, telegraphy, all these technologies were technologies for a particular individual application. And what we replaced it with is technologies that are useful for all applications, generic technologies. And um, and that's really critical. So like when electric vehicles come along, people think, oh, we need to have a specific solution for this one particular end use. No, you need to have a solution for customers in general who may have bursty loads, but you don't want to make it specific to an individual device. Um, uh, mechanisms are always better than the application specific one. Um, there's this notion that electrons aren't all the same, which as we know is, is nonsense. Um, and so then some people would say, oh, I want to charge one tariff for your electric vehicle charging and a different set of prices for your other devices. Um, that doesn't actually make any sense with respect to physics because, again, the electrons are the same. Uh, or that they want to arrange flexibility differently for different devices. What your, thermos, what your furnace is using as controlled by your thermostat is different from what your lights and other devices are. It's nonsense. The electrons are all the same. We need universal mechanisms. Um, there's this, I already covered this on uh, non-deterministic systems. You know, we rely on non-deterministic systems every day uh, for a whole lot of things, and that's that's the future. Um, and then some people, for engaging flexibility, want to sell electricity at one price through one mechanism, and then engage in flexibility, like through aggregators or such. To, um, to make the demand side you know, operate in a way that's uh, better for the supply side. But 
They're only doing that because they charge the right wrong price in the first place. Um, if you charge the right price in the first place, you wouldn't need to have this separate mechanism to account for that you charge the wrong price. When I was in my you know, elementary school, I started learning how to program computers and garbage out. If you have a great algorithm, but you get a bad data, you'll have a bad result. If you have bad prices, you'll have a bad result. And that that's, should be not a surprise. So again, as I said, I haven't thought of any other mechanisms that could possibly serve this role as a fundamental mechanism. Um, and while you can do other things in some contexts, um, they always break down um, when you move to other contexts. Well, then, and you want to operate off grid, if you've got some cloud based entity orchestrating your devices in your buildings and you don't have an internet connection, uh, you're screwed. But if you're using pricing, you can generate the price locally and your, your water heater won't even know or care that the grid went down. So using prices is not new. There was this paper from 82, uh, another every paper that used the phrase prices to devices from 2006. And there's a say I haven't actually read either do that when I find time. Um, so I only came to this in, in 2010. I, I came to this much later than other people did. So the whole notion of, of using uh, quality retail prices has been around for a long time. Um, I got my start in thinking about this uh, from this photograph, which I know exactly when it was on that, luckily. <laughs> it's very convenient. And later, in how do you move electricity around in an off-grid context, either within an individual household or between a village that's off-grid that maybe actually in five or 10 years gets a grid connection, uh, but maybe it's an un unreliable grid connection. So you wanna have a ways to move around electricity over space and over time, over time through storage uh, in ways that can be completely self-organizing, can be inherently safe uh, and can really scale from the small systems to the largest system. And I came up with price. So that's how I came to it from thinking about what's good for the customer, whereas the other people were thinking, let's use price because that's good for the grid. Now it turns out the price is actually better for both the customer and the grid. But if you think of it from a customer centric point of view, it, it gives you a different sense of uh, how you think about it from if you have a grid centric point of view. So another critical thing we want to use is we wanna manage all power flows digitally, just like we manage all data flows digitally. So USB does this, it has for you know, a few decades now, you own devices that do this. On the same cable, you have generalized data communication, power, and critically, communications about the power to manage the flow of power. And that allows you to do things like change the voltage uh, on it, which you can do with both USB and with ethernet. It allows you to do this permission-based capacity management and, and other things. Um, it, um, it, the key thing is that it's all on the same cable, but they're all three on different wires. With Ethernet, it's the same cable. They're all on the same wires. That's an implementation detail that's confined to the link technology. It doesn't really matter beyond that. The important thing is the same cable. This is, again, where the, the control and the data plane are unified. They're not separate. So um, this is much easier to do with DC power than with AC. You know, Basically, it's just not worth doing with DC, with AC, but with DC, it is. And so that's one reason. We ended up using all AC because we didn't have uh, power electronics back in the 1880s, but now we do. So now we can actually make much more use of DC than we used to. So that's part of my work is to work on uh, technologies to more easily use um, DC distribution inside of buildings. So um, we all use digitally managed power today. We just need to scale it up to higher, higher levels. On the utility grid, what a lot of people do is they take utility and say, oh, we want to make our microgrid. Let's take our expensive, brittle utility technology and make it smaller, which makes it even more expensive and more brittle. But if you take simple technology and you scale it up, just like the first airplane was one person, 12 seconds, 80 feet, now we have jumbo jets. Most technology, they scale up. You get to a different place, depending on where you start from. So, um, what I came up with was, was somebody else, it wasn't just me, uh, was this concept of lower power integration where um, technologies for moving the electricity around inside of a building, uh, technologies for how devices know what to do, should a light be on or off, dim, the blue, flashing, um, 
The functionality is from the application protocols, the same application protocols we already use, so nothing changed there. We just need to have these power distribution technologies, which we have in the form of things like USB and Ethernet, but they're only isolated link technologies. You know, US, Ethernet and Wi-Fi useless by themselves because you almost never want to talk to the device at the other end of the link. You want to talk to a device multiple hops away. It's the internet protocol which allows you to go from a link context to a network context. And that what's what price and quantity does is it allows you to go from a link context to a network context. So, um, so that division between those allows each of them to evolve separately. That's just how things operate on the internet, and that's what allows systems to evolve um, much better. So one thing that comes out of this is you can network electricity itself. So this could be your, you know, my house or this building or a car. It could be any power distribution system. Uh, you could you can arrange what I call nanogrids in a mesh network or any tree structure. Nanogrid has a uh, nanogrid controller, an infrastructure device that's analogous to an Ethernet switch. It's not analogous to an IP router because, again, we're not routing packets analogous to an Ethernet switch. Um, and then you distribute power to load. And you may have, so you have your, your downstream, you know, local connections, and then you have your upstream connections to other nanogrids. And then you have a microgrid controller, which then it's actually the same as the other ones, but it's just the one that interfaces with the utility grid. And some of these could be AC, some could be DC, they could be different voltages, and you can make or break the power connections whenever you want to, and the system will automatically adjust because the grid has its own local price. So how how might you get a net flow of power from here over to there? Well, this nanogrid controller not only never talks about it, it does not even know that it exists. In this model, all the communication is only over a over a direct electrical connection to the watt to the device at the other end of the link. But the value of this might be zero cents, maybe it's 10 cents here, 12 cents, 60 cents. You can have a net flow of electricity over multiple links to pop communication. So it's a model which is both simple and, and completely flexible. Uh, also to um, when when a power connection fails or a piece of equipment fails, this system just automatically reroutes the power around it. So um, in 1969, they built uh, this device here about the size of a refrigerator. I'm sure it would cost millions of dollars in today's money. It's basically a four port Ethernet switch, okay? Now you can buy them. The technology scaled because it has these inherent characteristics. You don't find that kind of scaling with um, traditional electrical technology. So one of my goals has been to build the world's first fully functional nanogrid controller, and hopefully early next year we actually actually have that. So, um, oh, oops, here. How does this actually all work? So in that model, there are only four messages for this physical layer distribution between the two things. It turns out the first three messages already exist in USB and in Ethernet in devices that you already own. The only thing that gets added is a price and a non-binding forecast of the future price. This is really simple, and this simplicity makes it allow us to be interoperable and low cost and cyber secure. Because if you're not sharing information, you can't get hacked or you can't uh, violate. So this um, there's a huge number of advantages to this model. It could extend anywhere from this building again to an off-grid village on another continent. So. Key to this then is to separate as much as possible the customer domain from the from the grid domain. I used to only ever talk about buildings, but as I talk to more grid people, I realized I should be talking about customers. So they realize the only reason we have the utility grid is to serve the needs of customers. It's the other way around, uh, but they're just wrong. So from the from the local area network, from the building, the grid should be just a black box. You shouldn't know or care what's on the other side of the meter. And the reverse should be true. The utility should have no knowledge of what devices you own or their status and control. It should just be about um, price and quantity. Uh, and, and actually another critical thing here is that uh, a lot of people even today will say that you have to exactly, which is not true because now we have battery, now we have storage. And in, in order to create internet technology, we of course had to have digital communication, but we also had to have data storage. 
The storage was assembled, essential to have more loosely coupled systems instead of tightly coupled. And so now that we have electricity storage, we can be more loose about how things work. You have you we use prices at the meter. We always use prices. They're usually terrible prices. Then we can have better prices there, and then we can have this rich infrastructure inside the buildings of prices uh, for, for different power domains. One mechanism uh, at all scales. So there's, I'd like to use this term coordination architecture, which is um, ultimately gets down to, and this is usually between the grid and the customer or the grid and customer device. Who talks to whom about what? So in a particular way of doing things, we exist and what are they communicating about? Um, either providing information or exercising control. So 50 years ago or so, there was direct load control where utilities would send out signals over radio or over power lines to cycle off water heaters or air conditioners. That works. They have, don't really get any good feedback. So they don't like it. Um, then we, about 20 years ago, started introducing a lot of event-based demand response where a dozen days a year you have an event and you and a, something specific. The other 350 three days are quote unquote regular days, so you do nothing at all. It works, but it's an extremely limited tool. Um, there's prices, which is what I'm advocating here. And then there are complicated things with biddings and auctions, which you could make work. I think they would end up working about the same as prices, except that they add this enormous amount of complexity uh, to the system and cost, which could never be justified by over how pricing works. So. Those systems are just never going to happen. People love to talk about them because they're really cool constructs, but they're never going to happen in the real world. You know, just like, you know, flying cars. I drove down here. I didn't see a single flying car on the, around on the freeway, even though people started talking about it 60 years ago. So ultimately, the ideal number of ways of doing this globally is one. You know, on the Internet Engineering Task Force, where I worked, you know, collaborated for several years, they have if there's a technology solution like a communication protocol for a problem that works you do not develop a second solution for the same thing you just use the one uh, to keep things simple because they understand the value of simplicity so uh, a lot of times people talk about grid services and, and talk about the various ways that grids and customers might interact and they they're always unsatisfying conversations i've been in hundreds of these because they're mixing things together that actually don't really have much in Energy, we can deal with through pricing. There's coordinating with inverters about power issues, power quality, reactive power, you know, frequencies and such. I'm not an electrical engineer. The inverter people seem to have that well in hand. It's a separate problem. It needs a separate solution. And, and there are solutions and, and so that we don't have to complicate our discussions about energy just by, by polluting with these power discussions. And then this last part about managing capacity, we typically don't do, but um, we absolutely need to for vehicle charging. In Australia, they are using it today to manage excess solar from feeders where you have a whole lot of customers with um, PV panels. Sometimes it was having, somebody would say, I want to put PV on my house. And the grid would say, you cannot, because a few hours a year, there'll be too much power coming back from all these panels. So now what they're doing is they're broadcasting out um, a, an interval limit each customer can export to the grid to make sure we don't overload the feeder. It's not a limit on what the PV produces because it's the PV minus whatever the loads are. So if you're in danger of exporting too much, you could curtail your PV or you could just increase your load. You could charge a car, you could heat some water, things like that. So capacity management is something that absolutely the utility needs to be working on. Um, and, but again, it's it's a separate problem, and there might be prices associated with this, but it's separate. So what might these prices look like? Um, these are some real prices that people were charged um, those back, back eight, uh, nine years ago uh, in Illinois. Now, they don't vary that much. So in, in this case, it's only a few cents. So not much dynamic range, so it doesn't give you a lot of opportunity to save money. The more the prices range, in Hawaii, they're talking about maybe 40 cents difference between the, the high price time in the day and the low price time. We make it really worthwhile for customers to buy technologies to shift load. My heat pump controller for my heat pump 
takes in prices today and optimizes to them. Now I only pay TOU prices because I can't pay an hourly price here, but once that gets charged, my the device I already own in my house can, can operate, do that directly. That's what we need. We need to start distributing technology that's ready for the future. So um, I never use the term real-time price in this context. Real-time price is a wholesale market construct. It's about wholesale markets. It's not about retail markets. If you go to the store to buy tomatoes or bananas, that's a retail transaction. You don't know what the wholesale market for bananas or tomatoes are. It's a separate thing. Now, there's some loose relationship between the two, but they're only loosely coupled. They're not highly coupled. And if we went from flat prices to a retail price that was calculated from the wholesale price, we would be better off. But that would not be the right price. It's a which is the one that's actually best for the grid and best for the customers than something that's calculated directly from a wholesale price. So highly dynamic prices, um, the, the time interval of the price is between hourly and five minutes. I've worked on this area for the last three and a half years. Zero people have opined that they think we need prices that are fashionable in five minutes. Nobody thinks that. And it doesn't make sense to have intervals less than hours. So that brackets that. You want to set it no further than different every day because if you don't, they're not responsive to the actual grid conditions, and then they're not the right price. Again, it's garbage in, garbage out. Um, now, this doesn't guarantee it's the right price, but you have to have these if you have any hope. And we will no doubt start with prices that are announced a day in advance, and then over time, as people become more comfortable with it, have prices that are day of. Um, you know, like weather forecasts these days are pretty good. You know, you can look at the temperature for cool temperatures, we'll track it pretty well. And the same will be true of electricity prices. So people will relax about the distinction between prices that are guaranteed versus prices that are just forecast. We also want to say that well, the market is different for the what the utilities sell versus what they buy back. Maybe they sell at 20 cents, buy back at 10 cents. That's done in some places. That's being proposed for solar customers in California. There are, there are even four against it, but it's a legitimate toolbox. We also want a margin on greenhouse gas emissions so that customers who want to use that can. What you do is you pick your dollar per ton figure, $50, $100, $1,000 a ton, multiply it by the uh, kilogram per kilowatt hour, figure this broadcast, you add that to the retail price, and then you optimize to this hybrid combined price, because since climate change is real, the retail price by itself is actually the wrong price because it doesn't take into account the real cost of carbon. And every so often you have financial alerts, grid emergency, power shocks, wildfire, um, but that's it. There's no other information you need to do for energy. Um, and this is my model for how things work in buildings. I'm a building person. You have a price server uh, that's like a web server. It doesn't compute any information, it just distributes it. Uh, the California Energy Commission has one operating today that you can go query to get prices. Today, it's only things like time of, but when we start getting hourly prices, it'll do that too. Uh, we have a research price server uh, for a project that work on. And then the green signals are those ones for the, the price, the GHG, and emergency alerts. Uh, some device down here translates from price to functional control um, to turn a compressor on and off or change the level of the light. So the functional control signals are the orange ones. So any of these four devices, the device itself, uh, an controller, some central device in the building, or some cloud-based entity can do this. Um, you might wonder why would you send the price from the building out to the cloud instead of sending growth from here because this is a local price. The value of electricity in the building may diverge from what it is on the grid. So if you're not optimizing for local price, you're optimizing for the wrong price. Um, so this, I, I drew this about three years ago and it has one bit since I originally drew it, which makes me pretty confident that it's, that it's in good. Uh, I don't know if, okay. I'll, I'll try to get far away from here. Um, let's see. So uh, these high dynamic prices have a lot of benefits. It's simple, it improves the privacy because the utility doesn't know what devices you own. It only observes what, um, and 
you, you can actually layer other mechanisms on top of the price, but you, if those other mechanisms fail or are not present, the system will always continue to keep operating. And you know, a lot of cases we have aggregator models where you um, utilities will pay like Google or Ecobee to manage the thermostat. They typically take half of the value um, of, of the flexibility that gets engaged. Now I spent thousands of dollars times to put a heat pump and a heat pump controller in my house. And if I lost half the value of flexibility to um, to somebody else and didn't get it, we'd make it far less cost effective to invest in these electrification and demand flexible resources. So I think we simply cannot afford as a society to have this model where somebody else takes away uh, half the value. Now, customers should be empowered to, to hire somebody to optimize their system. So if pay me 50 cents a month to optimize your thermostat, a lot of people might be very happy with that. But then the customer is in charge instead of the aggregator being charged. Because if there's an aggregator model with bad prices, the customer has no choice. They can only do it through the aggregator. But if you have pricing, the customer is empowered to have choice. And that's what we need. So ultimately, everybody except for the aggregator is better off with prices. And so we think that is absolutely the way to go. So these are the other models that people uh, talk about. And as I say, I think they're all have higher costs and they all perform less well than pricing. And so it's, it's really, I don't, I don't think there's any contest as to what the right way to go is. So um, again, one mechanism at all scales. It turns out today, according to the ethernet standard, you can put a price for the value of electricity on that ethernet cable, not according to an application protocol, but according to the ethernet standard itself. I don't think there's any products in the market that use this, but it's there in the standard. I know it's there because I put it there. Um, and one way to scale, that's how the internet works. That's what pricing um, can do. So people talk about virtual power plants as sort of the today's rebranding of aggregators, um, but customers are not power plants. They have different characteristics. And if grid people think of customers as power plants, they are going to think about the problem wrong. Um, we need to have, uh, aggregators and virtual power plants in the near term, but we make, need to make sure that uh, pricing can compete on an equal footing so that customers who want to take advantage of flexibility themselves or the devices they buy uh, can, can do it directly. And so, yeah, actually I was supposed to read that slide. So um, yeah, we need to have a way where these can both coexist. We need to start offering people good prices as soon as possible so that manufacturers have an incentive and taking these prices directly. And everything needs to be globally standard. We don't want things to be different in different countries because we're all trying to solve the same problem. That's what we learned with communication. Everybody is, has the same problem. Um, but now there's this communication standard, OpenAPR 3.0, to very simply and easily communicate these kinds of signals. And it was actually only completed about a month ago. Uh, I led the process to create it. So I'm I think it's the best thing since sliced bread. Um, and critically, energy access, where I started, off-grid people with almost no money, it supports that. So there are hundreds of millions of people on the planet today. They own one electrical device. It's a mobile phone, and they charge it with USB, just like we all do today. How can those people who have almost no money have access to this wonderful technology? It's because we all use the same technology. We need to make sure that whatever technology we use on the Stanford campus and wherever you live and wherever I live, that it can scale up and down to be suitable for everybody on the planet. That's the only way to get an equitable future. That's it. Thank you. Questions, answers. So 
is technically possible to have a system <clears throat> where every customer created this big curve of supply demand and saying, depending on what the price is, I would consume different amounts in the next hour. Uh, there are no buildings at all on the planet today that I know of, or maybe there's a you know a dozen in research projects that do this. Uh, how my house would necessarily do a good job at forecasting its demand and forecasting this flexibility when it doesn't know when I'm just going to be turning on the oven to make a number of things. Uh, it's a mind-bogglingly complex problem that basically nothing does today. But if you did it, you would probably end up with the same result as if you just used prices. The key thing is that with prices, you you rely on the large, you know, value of large numbers of things evening out, sort of the randomness of different customer behavior averaging out. And that's how the grid works today. The reason people want to go to those systems is because they think the only way the system can work is if it's look at those. But it would be so expensive to do this, you would not get to a better result than than, than just using prices do. And so it's never going to happen because Nobody is in their right mind is going to say, as a society, we should invest tens of billions of dollars to create this whole new system to get to a result that we can get to far ch more cheaply. So in theory, you could do it, but we never will. Like, I don't, I, I need to buy an airplane ticket. Uh, this morning, I'm, I'm going to go to a meeting in Europe, uh, which is wonderful news. Um, I don't put in a bid for which different flights I would do. And then once a week, the airlines like do all these things. They just post a price and I look at the prices available and I select one. The way the world works is with these non-determinist systems. Sure, there are these niche cases like wholesale markets where there's deterministic systems, but that's not how the world works in general. The people who want those systems believe they have a non-determinist system and they're just wrong, okay? But does, does that kind of make sense? Yeah, yeah. I agree with you. So those nano controllers I had, so within the building, each grid controller, whether it's a microcontroller or the nano controller, sets its own local price. It has to have an algorithm to do that. And how those work can be a subject of innovation. So um the algorithms for both the grid controllers and the devices don't have to be standard. The communication has to be standard. So with HTTP and HTML, we have a structure where we have interoperability because things are standard, but that doesn't mean that all web pages look the same. So in other words, we can have a system which does both in innovation and interoperability. So it's the cost I set the price and I, I have some ideas, but I know that we need a whole lot of other smart people, maybe some of you in this room, to work on that. Um, but you know, you learn from what happened yesterday. You, you see about supply, you know, patterns or patterns of different prices. You look at demand patterns from, from yesterday. You look at your battery state of charge. Use that. So, how you manage the battery and how you set the price are not two problems, but they're two aspects of the same problem. Um, but your price and if, if it seems to be like it's too low and your battery gets depleted too much so well you just raise the price so you can always it's like flying an airplane you can always just adjust to keep things um, balanced uh yes so uh soon for them to become uh, mandatory. I think people always should have the option of um, a, a less than price if they want. Although I don't think it's up to the utility necessarily to be the one that does that. Basically, if we had dynamic prices today and somebody proposed, oh, we should have flat prices, and that's kind of like saying that you should be able to buy any seat, a seat on any flight from here to New York, any hour of the day, any day of the year for the same amount. Airlines, it was oh, sort of $2,000. You could have whatever seat you want, but if you want to save money, you would be on a dynamic price. Um, so, whether it's through a third party that provides insurance, insurance always has a premium, or by the utility directly, sure, you could have this flat price, but you'll be probably paying a lot more money at the end of the day than if you're on dynamic price. But as we introduce it, initially, we want to just make it an attractive offer so that people who want to try it out do. 
they will save money. They'll tell their neighbors and their you know friends and family, hey, I'm saving money by doing this, and I'm also helping the environment. I'm getting more renewables on the grid. There's no downside. You should do the same thing, and then it'll spread. And also, all of their price response needs to be automated. We do not want humans in the loop. People, you should express preferences, but you shouldn't be actually doing it. Like I can express preferences like flash or not on my phone. Phone, it does all of the complex stuff. I'm not in the loop setting the focus, exposure time because the automation is far better than I could be, and I really don't have the interest to do it. There's one percent of the population that wants to do those things, and they should totally have that option. But you know, your water heater needs to do things while you're asleep. People don't want to spend time doing this. I don't. It has to be automated, and it can be. Like my heat pump controller is automated right now. Uh, is that other comments, questions? Is there, is there anything from online? That, yeah. Okay. So yeah, so I've been sort of trying to follow things that trees. And um, there's this, in a lot of places, notion to create flexibility markets that are somehow separate from the wholesale supply markets and also separate from the retail markets, which in the, these proposals, like uh, most particularly like the one in the UK, are incredibly complicated. Lots of different kinds of uh, entities doing lots of different kinds of transactions, all because they refuse to charge the right price for retail. Now, if you go to the grocery store, you don't next to the tomatoes saying, I'll pay you a dollar not to buy tomatoes this week. And there's not somebody asking you, are you using this tomato for pasta or for salad? They're just tomato, right? They're just electrons. So um, flexibility is not hard to engage in a retail market if you charge the right price. And then of course, if people have devices that can do that, if you charge the wrong price, you will have to go through all kinds of um, calisthenics to account for the fact that you're charging the and you won't, it'll be a definitely a substandard um, solution. Um, in California, our energy commission uh, has some a process called the load management standard to require utilities to offer highly dynamic prices by I think 2027. The public utilities commission also has a process called demand flex to do the same thing, which is good because otherwise, because it's usually the regulator that does this, not the energy commission, the policy organization. He screws things up or uh, in principle within you know three or four years, you should all have the opportunity to uh, pay these prices, save money and help the environment. Uh, that's that's the goal and the plan. And then there's a few things in other countries where such prices are being introduced. You can do a half hour price in the UK and some other ones. Uh, but I think we have the most coherent vision and we're getting into the technology detail, details of how more than people are in other places. So yeah, so the local price is the price on the customer side of the meter. So um, I may have gone through a few of them. So one is if there's a difference in the buy or sell price, utility sells at 20 cents, buys back at 10. Um, the local price is going to be somewhere between 10 and 20, and it could be in between. Um, if you want to take into account carbon emissions, that's another one. You add the carbon uh, burden to the price to optimize to that. <clears throat> um, if you have a, a DC power domain, or, or maybe you have an AC power domain that has a DC power domain between it and the grid domain. So when the grid goes down, you have some reliable DC and some reliable AC. Each of those domains of power will have a different price because if they're ever going to move power between them, there has to be sufficient price differential. The microgrid case, when the grid goes down, there is no retail price to generate the price locally to do this. Uh, and there's probably a few more, but those are certainly the major ones where the, the availability is different, so the price is good. Yeah. 
No, no, no. It, it, it's all automatic. The vacuum knows that, you know, unless it's really expensive, vacuuming is, you know, you want to do it right now. So it's just going to pay for the prices, unless it's completely extreme, you know. If, yeah, it's well, usually when you use the vacuum, it's really important. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, so if you had a device that was more discretionary, um, let's say uh, a sauna or something, where if, if the price is above a certain amount, you say, okay, it's just not worth taking a sauna. It would look at the price, and if the price went above that threshold, it would just stop heating. Um, and if you had a medical device, it would never look at the price. And if you had a light, as the price goes up, maybe the light above some high level starts to dim. But wait. Pricing operates is not to reduce the service output. Most of the way the price operates is to maintain the service, but shift the time of the consumption. So I have a 120 gallon water tank in my house, which provides both my space and my water heat. It can heat that tank during the, during the course of the day, soak up the excess PV from my solar panels. Through the evening, coast through, and even into the night, because I've got a whole lot of hot water there to either use as, as hot water or a space. So I get the same heat, I get the same hot water, but the time of the consumption. Of it. So shifting load is the vast majority of what occurs. Um, there's a there's a company eight blocks from my house that makes an induction stove with a battery inside of it. So that it can be a 120 volt appliance, not a 241. So you don't have to run a new wire to it if you're replacing a gas stove. And it just charges up the battery of the course of the day, soaking up those inexpensive uh, electrons from the TV we have and then when you want to turn the oven on or the burners it draws some power but most of it the energy comes from the battery so you're shifting load but you're still getting the same cooking experience so you only shed load you only reduce services on extreme days you know one to three days a year hopefully um the other 362 days a year you're only shifting load and that's a problem here because a whole lot of people get introduced to demand response for these emergency conditions, so they only think about shedding load. But you know, demand flexibility is ninety-eight percent about shifting load. So it's it's a it's a misperception of, of what's really going on. I think there was another. I'm sorry, what? Oh, well, I mean, the utility rate today uses price in wholesale markets, and, you know, PG&E has a big battery down in the Monterey area, and I assume they charge that battery when the prices are low, and they discharge the price when the batteries are high. So prices are already used on the grid side, because companies that you know have hundreds of millions of dollars at stake they want to use the right mechanism so they use prices right if they didn't use prices the system wouldn't work nearly as well so the prices are already used over there it's, it's using the prices at the meter and using the prices inside the grid is that I'm a building person, I'm a grid person, so uh, A, I don't know how the grid can be operated differently. If I thought I did, I would probably avoid saying it because I don't have expertise in that area. So I don't know how the grid should be worked. I just know how things should work inside of it. Um, but for Stanford, where you do have this you know, rich infrastructure of chilled water and hot water, presumably you could have a price for the value of the the hot water and the chilled water, and you use the same mechanism for, for
for the water energy as you do for the electric energy. So again, we want it all applications. It, it, it does generalize in that way. So it all depends on how dynamic the price is. So a few years ago, the winter time of use price from PG&E, which then translated to the CCA that I was due, was one cent a kilowatt hour difference between the high price and the low price. It was like 30 cents was the high price, 20 cents was the low price. That's really an insanely stupid difference. I think now it's at least four cents and in the summer it was 10 cents and Hawaii they're talking about 40 cents. So how much you can save depends on how big that dynamic range is. And that varies enormously from place to place. So it all depends on the tariffs that are chosen to be charged. And we should expect different you know, variations in different days. On some days when there's less need to shift load, there will be less of a difference. And other, it will be a very large difference when there's more need to shift load. So you will engage more flexibility when there's a bigger price and less when there's less because things have different efficiencies. You know, my, my water tank's pretty efficient um, because whatever I lose through the tank heats the house. So in the winter, it's not really a loss even. Um, batteries always there's a round trip efficiency loss in the capital cost. So there's um, you if you have a bigger price difference. Okay. And I'll be hanging around for anyone who wants to keep keep chatting. Thank you.